Volume One, Chapter Twentieth of The Antiquary. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Antiquary by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Twentieth. If you fail on her here, never presume to serve her any more. Bid farewell to the integrity of arms, and the honorable name of soldier fall from you, like a shivered wreath of laurel by thunder struck from a desertless forehead. A FAIR QUARREL Early the next morning a gentleman came to wait upon Mr. Lovell, who was up and ready to receive him. He was a military gentleman, a friend of Captain M'Intyre's, at present in Fairport on the recruiting service. Lovell and he were slightly known to each other. "'I presume, sir,' said Mr. Leslie, such was the name of the visitor, "'that you guessed the occasion of my troubling you so early.' A message from Captain M'Intyre, I presume. The same. He holds himself injured by the manner in which you declined yesterday to answer certain inquiries which he conceived himself entitled to make, respecting a gentleman whom he found in intimate society with his family. May I ask if you, Mr. Leslie, would have inclined to satisfy interrogatories so haughtily and unceremoniously put to you? Perhaps not and therefore, as I know the warmth of my friend M'Intyre on such occasions, I feel very desirous of acting as peacemaker. From Mr. Lovell's very gentlemanlike manners, every one must strongly wish to see him repel all that sort of dubious calumny which will attach itself to one whose situation is not fully explained. If you will permit me, in friendly conciliation, to inform Captain M'Intyre of his real name, for we are led to conclude that of Lovell is assumed. I beg your pardon, sir, but I cannot admit that inference. Or at least, said Leslie, proceeding, that it is not the name by which Mr. Lovell has been at all times distinguished. If Mr. Lovell will have the goodness to explain this circumstance, which, in my opinion, he should do injustice to his own character, I will answer for the amicable arrangement of this unpleasant business. Which is to say, Mr. Leslie, that if I condescend to answer questions which no man has a right to ask, and which are now put to me under penalty of Captain M'Intyre's resentment, Captain M'Intyre will condescend to rest satisfied. Mr. Leslie, I have just one word to say on this subject. I have no doubt my secret, if I had one, might be safely entrusted to your honour. But I do not feel called upon to satisfy the curiosity of any one. Captain M'Intyre met me in society, which of itself was a warrant to all the world, and particularly ought to be such to him, that I was a gentleman. He has, in my opinion, no right to go any further, or to inquire the pedigree, rank, or circumstances of a stranger who, without seeking any intimate connection with him, or his, chances to dine with his uncle, or walk in company with his sister. In that case, Captain M'Intyre requests you to be informed that your father visits at Monkbarns, and all connection with Miss M'Intyre, must be dropped, as disagreeable to him. I shall certainly, said Lovell, visit Mr. Oldbuck when it suits me, without paying the least respect to his nephew's threats or irritable feelings. I respect the young lady's name too much, though nothing can be slighter than our acquaintance, to introduce it into such a discussion. Since that is your resolution, sir, answered Leslie, Captain M'Intyre requests that Mr. Lovell, unless he wishes to be announced as a very dubious character, will favor him with a meeting this evening, at seven, at the thorn-tree in the little valley close by the ruins of St. Ruth. Most unquestionably, I will wait upon him. There is only one difficulty. I must find a friend to accompany me, and where to seek one on this short notice, as I have no acquaintance in Fairport. I will be on the spot, however. Captain M'Intyre may be assured of that." Leslie had taken his hat and was as far as the door of the apartment, when, as if moved by the peculiarity of Lovell's situation, he returned, and thus addressed him. 
Mr. Lovell, there is something so singular in all this that I cannot help again resuming the argument. You must be yourself aware, at this moment, of the inconvenience of your preserving an incognito, for which I am convinced there can be no dishonorable reason. Still, this mystery renders it difficult for you to procure the assistance of a friend in a crisis so delicate. Nay, let me add that many persons will even consider it as a piece of quixotry in Mintyre to give you a meeting, while your character and circumstances are involved in such obscurity. I understand your innuendo, Mr. Leslie, rejoined Lovell, and though I might be offended at its severity, I am not so, because it is meant kindly. But, in my opinion, he is entitled to all the privileges of a gentleman, to whose charge, during the time he has been known in the society where he happens to move, nothing can be laid that is unhandsome or unbecoming. For a friend, I dare say I shall find some one or other who will do me that good turn. And if his experience be less than I could wish, I am certain not to suffer, through that circumstance, which you are in the field for my antagonist. I trust you will not, said Leslie, but as I must, for my own sake, be anxious to divide so heavy a responsibility with a capable assistant, allow me to say that Lieutenant Taffril's gun brig is come into the roadstead, and he himself is now at old Caxon's, where he lodges. I think you have the same degree of acquaintance with him as with me, and— as I am sure I should willingly have rendered you such a service, were I not engaged on the other side, I am convinced he will do so at your first request. At the thorn-tree, then, Mr. Leslie, at seven this evening. The arms, I presume, are pistols? Exactly. Mintyre has chosen the hour at which he can best escape from Monkbarns. He was with me this morning by five, in order to return and present himself before his uncle was up. Good morning to you, Mr. Lovell. And Leslie left the apartment. Lovell was as brave as most men, but none can internally regard such a crisis as now approached, without deep feelings of awe and uncertainty. In a few hours he might be in another world, to answer for an action which his calmer thought told him was unjustifiable, in a religious point of view. Or he might be wandering about in the present like Cain, with the blood of his brother on his head. And all this might be saved by speaking a single word. Yet pride whispered that to speak that word now would be ascribed to a motive which would degrade him more low than even the most injurious reasons that could be assigned for his silence. Everyone, Miss Wardour included, must then, he thought, account him a mean, dishonored poltroon, who gave to the fear of meeting Captain Mintyre the explanation he had refused to the calm and handsome expostulations of Mr. Leslie. Mintyre's insolent behavior to himself personally, the air of pretension which he assumed towards Miss Wardour, and the extreme injustice, arrogance, and incivility of his demands upon a perfect stranger, seemed to justify him in repelling his rude investigation. In short, he formed the resolution which might have been expected from so young a man, to shut the eyes, namely, of his calmer reason, and follow the dictates of his offended pride. With this purpose he sought Lieutenant Taffril. The lieutenant received him with the good breeding of a gentleman and the frankness of a sailor, and listened with no small surprise to the detail which preceded his request that he might be favoured with his company at his meeting with Captain Mintyre. When he had finished, Taffril rose up and walked through his apartment once or twice. "'This is a most singular circumstance,' he said, and really, I am conscious, Mr. Taffril, how little I am entitled to make my present request, but the urgency of circumstances hardly leaves me an alternative.' "'Permit me to ask you one question,' asked the sailor. "'Is there anything of which you are ashamed, in the circumstances, which you have declined to communicate?' "'Upon my honour, no. There is nothing but what, in a very short time, I trust I may publish to the whole world.' 
"'I hope the mystery arises from no false shame, "'at the lowness of your friends, perhaps, or connections.' "'No, on my word,' replied Lovell. "'I have little sympathy for that folly,' said Taffril. "'Indeed, I cannot be supposed to have any, "'for, speaking of my relations, "'I may be said to have come myself from before the mast, "'and I believe I shall very soon form a connection, "'which the world will think low enough, "'with a very amiable girl, "'to whom I have been attached since we were next-door neighbours, "'at a time when I little thought of the good fortune "'which has brought me forward in the service.' "'I assure you, Mr. Taffril, replied Lovell, "'whatever were the rank of my parents, "'I should never think of concealing it from a spirit of petty pride. "'But I am so situated at present "'that I cannot enter on the subject of my family with any propriety.' "'It is quite enough,' said the honest sailor. "'Give me your hand. "'I'll see you as well through this business as I can, "'though it is but an unpleasant one, after all.' "'But what of that? Our own honour has the next call on us after our country. "'You are a lad of spirit, and I own, I think, Mr. Hector M'Intyre, "'with his long pedigree and his airs of family, very much of a jackanapes. "'His father was a soldier of fortune, as I am a sailor. "'He himself, I suppose, is little better, unless just as his uncle pleases.' and whether one pursues fortune by land or sea makes no great difference, I should fancy. None in the universe, certainly, answered Lovell. Well, said his new ally, we will dine together, and arrange matters for this rencounter. I hope you understand the use of this weapon. Not particularly, Lovell replied. I am sorry for that. Mintyre is said to be a marksman. "'I am sorry for it also,' said Lovell, "'both for his sake and my own. "'I must then, in self-defence, "'take my aim as well as I can.' "'Well,' added Taffril, "'I will have our surgeon's mate on the field, "'a good clever young fellow at Culkin, a shot-hole. "'I will let Leslie, who is an honest fellow for a landsman, "'know that he attends for the benefit of either party. "'Is there anything I can do for you in case of an accident?' "'I have but little occasion to trouble you,' said Lovell. "'This small billet contains the key of my escritoire, and my very brief secret. "'There was one letter in the escritoire, digesting a temporary swelling of the heart as he spoke, "'which I beg the favour of you to deliver with your own hand.' "'I understand,' said the sailor. "'Nay, my friend, never be ashamed for the matter.' An affectionate heart may overflow for an instant at the eyes, if the ship were clearing for action. And, depend on it, whatever your injunctions are, Dan Taffril will regard them like the bequest of a dying brother. But this is all stuff. We must get our things in fighting order, and you will dine with me and my little surgeon's mate, at the Graham's Arms over the way, at four o'clock. Agreed, said Lovell. Agreed, said Taffril, and the whole affair was arranged. It was a beautiful summer evening, and the shadow of the solitary thorn tree was lengthening upon the short green sward of the narrow valley, which was skirted by the woods that closed around the ruins of St. Ruth. Reader's note, supposed to have been suggested by the old abbey of Arborath in Forfarshire. End Reader's Note Lovell and Lieutenant Taffril, with the surgeon, came upon the ground with the purpose of a nature very uncongenial to the soft, mild, and pacific character of the hour and scene. The sheep, which during the ardent heat of the day had sheltered in the breaches and hollows of the gravely bank, or under the roots of the aged and stunted trees, had now spread themselves upon the face of the hill to enjoy their evening's pasture, and bleated to each other with that melancholy sound which at once gives life to a landscape and marks its solitude. Taffril and Lovell came on in deep conference, having, for fear of discovery, 
sent their horses back to the town by the lieutenant's servant. The opposite party had not yet appeared on the field, but when they came upon the ground, there sat upon the roots of the old thorn, a figure as vigorous in his decay as the moss-grown but strong and contorted boughs which served him for a canopy. It was old Ochiltree. "'This is embarrassing enough,' said Lovell. "'How shall we get rid of this old fellow?' "'Here, Father Adam,' cried Taffril, who knew the mendicant of yore. "'Here's half a crown for you. "'You must go to the four horseshoes yonder, the little inn you know, "'and inquire for a servant with blue and yellow livery. "'If he's not come, you'll wait for him, "'and tell him we shall be with his master in about an hour's time. "'At any rate, wait there till we come back, and get off with you. "'Come, come, weigh anchor.' "'I thank you for your amus, said Ochiltree, pocketing the piece of money. But I beg your pardon, Mr. Taffril, I canna gang your errand to you now. Why not, man? What can hinder you? I would speak a word with young Mr. Lovell. With me? answered Lovell. What would you say with me? Come, say on and be brief. The mendicant led him a few paces aside. Are ye indebted anything to the laird among barns? Indebted? No, not I. What of that? What makes you think so? Ye mun ken, I was at the shearers the day. For God help me, I gang about the gates like the troubled spirit. And why should come whirling there in a post chase but monk barns in an uncou carfuffle? Now it's no a little thing that will make his honour take a chase and post horse twy days running. Well, well, what is all this to me? Hoy, ye's here, ye's here. Well, Mungborn's closeted with the shearer, whatever poor folk may be left there out. Ye need not doubt that. The gentlemen all are uncou civil among themselves. For heaven's sake, my old friend, can ye abide me gang to the devil at eins, Mr. Lovell? It might be more purpose for ye than to speak o' heaven in that impatient gate. But I have private business with Lieutenant Taffel here. Weel, well, I in good time," said the beggar. "I can use a little wee bit freedom with Mister Daniel Traffle. Money's the peery in the tap. I worked for him lang syne, for I was a worker in wood as weel as a tinkler." "You are either mad, Adam, or have a mind to drive me mad." "Nine of the twa," said Eddie, suddenly changing his manner from the protracted drawl of the mendicant to a brief and decided tone. "The shira." sent first clerk, and as the lad is rather light of the tongue, I find it was for drawing a warrant to apprehend ye. I thought it had been on a fugie warrant, for debt. For I what he kens the laird likes naebody to put his hand in his pooch. But now I might hide my tongue, for I see that entire lad and Mr. Leslie coming up, and I guess that Monk Barnes's purpose was very kind, and that yours is muckle war than it should be. The antagonist, now approached, and saluted with the stern civility which befitted the occasion. "'What has this old fellow to do here?' said M'Intyre. "'I'm an old fellow,' said Eddie. "'But I'm also an old soldier of your father's, for I served with him in the forty-second. "'Serve where you please, you have no title to intrude on us,' said M'Intyre, or—' and he lifted his cane in terrorum though without the idea of touching the old man. But Ochiltree's courage was roused by the insult. How down your switch, Captain M'Intyre! I am an old soldier, as I said before, and I'll take Muckle Fry, your father's son. But no a touch of the wand, while my pike staff will hoy together. Well, well, I was wrong. I was wrong, said M'Intyre. Here's a crown for you. Go your ways. What's the matter now? The old man drew himself up to the full advantage of his uncommon height, and in despite of his dress, which indeed had more of the pilgrim than the ordinary beggar, looked from height, manner, and emphasis of voice and gesture, rather like a grey palmer or eremite preacher, the ghostly counsellor of the young men who were around him, than the object of their charity. 
His speech, indeed, was as homely as his habit, but as bold and unceremonious as his erect and dignified demeanour. "'What are ye come here for, young men?' he said, addressing himself to the surprised audience. "'Are ye come amongst the most lovely works of God, to break his laws? Have ye left the works of man, the houses and the cities that are but clay and dust, like those that built them?' and are you come here among the peaceful hills and by the quiet waters that will last whiles aught earthly shall endure to destroy each other's lives that will live but an uncoo short time by the course of nature to make up a lying account at the close o't hoy sirs hi ye brothers sisters fathers that hae tended ye and mothers that have travailed for ye friends that i kite ye like a piece of their ain heart. And is this the way ye take to make them childless and brotherless and friendless? Hon, it's an ill-fight war. He that wins has the war sight. Think, Aunt Barnes. I'm a poor man, but I'm an old man too. And what my poverty takes away frae the weight of my counsel, grey hairs and truthful heart, should add in twenty times. Gang heim, gang heim, like good lads. The French will be o'er in harrying us, I know these days, and you'll hae fightin' enough, and maybe o'er daddy will hurt blood himself if he can get a field dyke to lay his gun o'er, and may live to tell ye what ye does the best where there's a good cause afore ye. There was something in the undaunted and independent manner, hearty sentiment, and manly rude elocution of the old man that had its effect upon the party and particularly on the seconds whose pride was uninterested in bringing the dispute to a bloody arbitrament and who on the contrary eagerly watched for an opportunity to recommend reconciliation upon my word mr leslie said taffril old adam speaks like an oracle our friends here were very angry yesterday and of course very foolish. Today they should be cool, or at least we must be so on their behalf. I think the word should be forget and forgive on both sides, that we should all shake hands, fire these foolish crackers in the air, and go home to sup in a body at the Graham's arms. I would heartily recommend it, said Leslie, for amidst a great deal of heat and irritation on both sides, I confess myself unable to discover any rational ground of quarrel. Gentlemen, said M'Intyre, very coldly, all this should have been thought of before. In my opinion, persons that have carried this matter so far as we have done, and who should part without carrying it any farther, might go to supper at the Graham's Arms very joyously, but would rise the next morning with reputations as ragged as our friend here who has obliged us with a rather unnecessary display of his oratory. I speak for myself, that I find myself bound to call upon you to proceed without more delay. And I, said Lovell, as I never desired any, have also to request these gentlemen to arrange preliminaries as fast as possible. Bairns, bairns, cried old Ochiltree, but perceiving he was no longer attended to, "'Madmen, I should say. Put your blood be on your heads.' And the old man drew off from the ground, which was now measured out by the seconds, and continued muttering and talking to himself in sullen indignation, mixed with anxiety, and with a strong feeling of painful curiosity. Without paying farther attention to his presence or remonstrances, Mr. Leslie and the lieutenant made the necessary arrangements for the duel, and it was agreed that both parties should fire when Mr. Leslie dropped his handkerchief. The fatal sign was given, and both fired almost in the same moment. Captain Mintyre's ball grazed the side of his opponent, but did not draw blood. That of Lovell was more true to the aim. Mintyre reeled and fell. Raising himself on his arm, his first exclamation was, "'It is nothing! It is nothing!' "'Give us the other pistols.' "'But in an instant,' he said, in a lower tone, "'I believe I have enough, and what's worse, I fear I deserve it. "'Mr. Lovell, or 
whatever your name is, fly and save yourself. Bear all witness, I provoked this matter. Then raising himself again on his arm, he added, Shake hands, Lovell. I believe you to be a gentleman. Forgive my rudeness, and I forgive you my death. My poor sister. The surgeon came up to perform his part of the tragedy, and Lovell stood gazing upon the evil of which he had been the active though unwilling cause, with a dizzy and bewildered eye. He was roused from his trance by the grasp of the mendicant. Why stand you gazing on your dead? What's doomed is doomed, what's done is past recalling. But away, away, if you would save your young blood from a shameful death. I see the men out by yonder that are come over late to part ye. But out and alack, soon enough and hour soon to drag ye to prison. He is right, he is right, exclaimed Haffrel. You must not attempt to get on the high road. Get into the wood till night. My brig will be under sail by that time, and at three in the morning, when the tide will serve, I shall have the boat waiting for you at the Mussel Crag. Away, away, for heaven's sake. Oh, yes, fly, fly, repeated the wounded man, his words faltering with convulsive sobs. Come with me, said the mendicant almost dragging him off. The captain's plan is the best. I'll carry ye to a place where ye might be concealed in the meantime, were they to seek to ye with sleuth-hounds. Go, go, again urged Lieutenant Taffrel. To stay here is mere madness. It was worse madness to have come hither, said Lovell, pressing his hand. But farewell. And he followed Ochiltree, into the recesses of the wood. End chapter 20th